Greetings in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to Moments with Truth, which is a television outreach of the five gospel halls here in Tobago. We sincerely pray that you will be blessed as you view today's program. Our scripture reading today applies mostly to those who we describe as people who grew up in the church. They live in the church, quote unquote. Yet they have never come to know the Lord Jesus in a personal way. Their parents have always attended church. They have always attended church. They have even been baptized. They've taken communion. They are active members. And they have a sense of security. But it is a false sense of security because they never repented of their sins. They have never received Christ as their personal savior. They are still not saved. So beginning at John chapter 6 and verse 67, we read, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said unto him, Depart from here, and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see your works that you do. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For neither did his brothers believe in him. Then said Jesus unto them, My time is not yet come. But your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this, unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee, but when his brothers were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Now I am reminded of the Arabian proverb that talks about the four things that come not back. They are the spoken word, the sped arrow, the past life, and the neglected opportunity. What an opportunity it was for certain men to have lived in the time of Jesus. What a privilege to have had the, the opportunity of interacting with the incarnate God, observing his life, 
witnessing his works, listening to his words. The Lord Jesus spoke of this honor when he said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 13, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men desire to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Matthew 11 tells us that Jesus began rebuking the cities in which most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto you, Chorazin, he said. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sack sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, which is exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Tyre, Sidon, Sodom had an opportunity to repent and they did not repent. Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum also had an opportunity to repent and did not. But Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum had the privilege of seeing the mighty works of Jesus. So Jesus said, on the judgment day, their punishment will be more severe. The Bible says that with greater privilege comes greater opportunity and greater responsibility. And so we read in the book of Hebrews that he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sorrow, punishment, do you suppose shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant with which he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the grace, the spirit of grace. Greater privilege leads to greater responsibility and results in the sorrow punishment. The section of John that we read introduces us to people who were close to the Lord Jesus and how they related to him and how they responded to him. His disciples were close to the Lord Jesus and they embraced him. These 12 men left their careers to follow Jesus. They spent hours upon hours, days upon days with him. They got to know him. They saw the crowds that followed him increase as his popularity grew. But now these crowds left him in droves. The disciples must make another decision. Will they continue believing in Jesus or will they leave? And Jesus forces them to decide. He asks them this question. Now that the crowds have left, will you also go away? So their response to his question is every Christian's response. They said, Lord, to whom shall we go? They stuck to the Lord Jesus like glue because, as they said, you have the words of eternal life. We believe and are sure that you are the Son of God. These disciples, their reason for clinging to Jesus 
was completely rational. They heard his words, they saw his works, and on the basis of what they saw, and on the basis of what they heard, they trusted Jesus. They trusted him for the most precious gift any man could ever possess. They trusted him for eternal life. As the Son of God, only he could give that eternal life. And so their response to the Savior was decisive. Will you also go away is the question Jesus asked them. Lord, to whom shall we go was their response. In other words, we are not leaving. We believe in you. You know, the disciples did not only spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ. They took the opportunity to know him. They embraced him as their God and their Lord. And when we get to know him as God and Lord, he gives to us not religion, but he gives unto us salvation. The gift of God is eternal life and it's only through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The disciples got to know the Lord Jesus. They were close to him and they took the opportunity of that closeness to trust Jesus Christ as their savior. You know, Judas Iscariot was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. But instead of embracing Jesus, Judas Iscariot betrayed him. He enjoyed all the privileges of the other disciples. He got as physically close to Jesus as anyone could and as all the other disciples did. He walked with Jesus. He was able to have private conversations with the Son of God. Judas Iscariot slept in the same house with the Lord Jesus. He ate from the same pot. And Jesus called him friend. He had the honor of being so close to the one who could give to him eternal life. But instead of embracing the Lord Jesus, Judas betrayed Christ. He sold the only begotten Son of God for the price of a common slave. He betrayed the Son of God with a kiss. Judas is the best illustration of what it means to be near to church but far from God. The Lord Jesus said concerning Judas Iscariot in John chapter 6 and verse 70, the verse we read, Have I not chosen twelve, and one of you is a devil? You know, there's a group of Psalms called, called the imprecatory Psalms. And Psalm 109 is one of them. It's difficult to read. The psalm is about Judas Iscariot in prophecy. And verses 7 to 9 read like this. When he, Judas, shall be judged, let him be condemned. Let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few. And let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Judas went from spending precious years in the presence of Christ, the Son of God, to committing suicide. And Jesus said about him, the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better, Jesus said, for that man if he had never been born, it would have been better for Judas, Jesus said, if he had never been born. 
Judas uh, Iscariot must be the sorriest individual who ever walked the face of this earth. You know, someone wrote, of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these it might have been. Judas Iscariot will forever be saying, I had the greatest of opportunities, but I squandered it. He spent three years with the one who could give to him eternal life. Instead, he will spend eternity in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. So given the opportunity that is yours, given the privilege that is yours to receive the Lord Jesus as your savior, where will you spend eternity? Will you be like Judas, who walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, ate with Jesus, lived with Jesus, had the opportunity to obtain the eternal life that Jesus came to give and squandered it, turned his back on Jesus, rejected Jesus, only to live for eternity remembering that I had a chance, I had an opportunity, and I squandered it, didn't take advantage of it. Now, Judah says, only hope. If we had to call it hope, it's to spend eternity in the lake of fire, remembering, remembering, and hearing these words ringing in his ears, son, remember that you had a chance. You walked with Jesus. You had an opportunity to get to know the Son of God. But rather than embracing him, you betrayed him. You rejected him. And now... Your only hope is a lot eternity in the lake of fire. And so we read also in, in chapter 7, verses 1 to 10, that Jesus' brothers lived with him, yet they disbelieved him. The disciples embraced Jesus. Judas Iscariot rejected him. His brothers doubted him. Now, Jesus' household comprised of a father, Joseph, a mother, Mary, and four brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and at least two sisters. And although they lived so close to Jesus, his brothers did not recognize that their elder brother was the second person of the Trinity. And someone wrote, that Jesus was good beyond all goodness known to the children of Adam. He was loving and kind, patient and pure, wise and capable beyond all others. Yet there his brothers failed to recognize him for who and what he was. It is a remarkable tribute, this writer says, to the genuineness of his perfect humanity and a sad tribute to their blindness. Even his astounding miracles failed to convince them. His teaching did not stir them. His claims did not impress them. His character did not interest them. And when Jesus started making the claims about who he really is. They simply did not believe, and that unbelief would keep them out of heaven. That belief had consequences. They could not rely, the brothers of the Lord Jesus, and his sisters, and even his mother, could not rely on the fact that they were so closely related to him. His brothers could not rely on the fact that they were so closely related to Jesus to get them to heaven. 
they may have been his brothers but if they did not believe in Christ if they did not acknowledge him as the son of God if they did not accept him as their savior they would miss heaven just as anyone else who did not you know, Jesus' brothers were like every other Jew. Paul said to the Romans in Romans chapter 9 that the Jews had a very unique opportunity. But not every Jew took advantage of that opportunity. Paul said, For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children? You see, every Jew came out of the loins of Jacob. Every Jew came out of the loins of Abraham. But not every Jew knew the God of, of Jacob. And not every Jew knew the God of Abraham. As close as these Jews were to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, most of them did not know God. Most of them were lost. And Jesus' siblings were in a similar position. So before Jesus died and rose again from the dead, his brothers, as close as they were to him, did not believe him. And in the same way, the fact that a person has a father or mother, a brother or a sister who is a Christian does not save that person. A person does not become a Christian, a person does not have eternal life because his or her father is a pastor of a church or an elder. God does not give access to heaven because you were baptized or take the communion or, or preach or, or sing in the choir or work in the church. Jesus said, you must be born again. God is providing opportunities for you to have eternal life. But that opportunity in and of itself is not salvation. We are called upon to take an action. In order for a person to be rightly related to God, in order for a person to be guaranteed a place in heaven, that person must take an action. That person must believe in Jesus. If you want to see God, if you want to spend eternity with God, if you want eternal life, you must receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You are required to repent of your sins and turn to the crucified, buried, and risen Christ in order to receive eternal life. In other words, opportunity does not equal salvation. Judas had a great opportunity. He was a disciple of Jesus. He interacted with the Lord Jesus, the one who could provide him eternal life. Judas was as close to Jesus as anyone else could be, but he missed him. Judas missed salvation, and Judas went to hell. You know, Jesus' brothers had a great opportunity as well. They lived with the Son of God. They interacted with Christ. They interacted with eternal life. 
they almost missed him. They almost went to hell. But after Christ's resurrection, his brothers believed. They received eternal life. They were guaranteed a place in heaven. So if Jesus' brothers needed to believe those with whom he was connected by human blood, if they needed to receive Christ, so does everyone else. No one gets a pass. Salvation comes to us through individual faith or connection with Christian parents. No matter how notable those Christian parents may be, those connections do not get us to heaven. Salvation comes to us through individual faith. So the Bible tells us, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. But if you believe on Jesus, if you trust him as your savior, if you put aside your religion, if you put aside your deception that because of your connection to a Christian person, if you put all that aside and come to Christ, you will have eternal life. But if you do not believe in Christ, you will remember for all eternity that you had opportunities to avoid hell, but you did not. And that is why we call upon you today to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Do not rely upon your religion. Do not rely upon your connection with Christian people. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. God is calling upon you to make a decision, a personal decision, to trust his son. And if you trust him, eternal life will be yours. And we hope that you will heed this calling and come to Christ, receive him as your savior. And as, as is often said, receive him as your savior and all will be well. And so Father, we thank you again for this opportunity. We've had to share the gospel with men and women, boys and girls. We thank you, Father, for the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And we ask that those who will hear this message will take the opportunity to trust him, trust Christ before it is forever too late. We pray these things for Christ Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you for viewing today's program. We invite you to contact us at any of the media advertised or visit us at any of the meetings that appear on the screen. Dear friends, remember that Jesus saves, he keeps, and he satisfies. May God bless you.